Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to this evening's play briefing for David Williamson's Family Values. Before we begin tonight, I'd just like to honour the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, the Turrbal and Yuggera people. On behalf of all the creatives on stage with me this evening, we acknowledge that this space, this place, has always been a site of storytelling. Welcome everyone to season 2023 and to the first subscriber briefing of the year. For those of you who are long-standing VIPs of our company, welcome back. And for those of you who are here for the first time, we expend an extra special salutation. You are joining the ranks of a very, very cool club, one that gets all the behind-the-scenes secrets, some plot spoilers, and some juicy creative insights ahead of the production debut's preview performance this Saturday. Subscriber briefings are all about um, illuminating parts of the artistic process, casting, programming, rehearsal, design, that would otherwise remain invisible to you. Um, when you sit in your seat and enjoy the show being magicked by our teams of brilliant creatives like this one here tonight. So tonight there will be questions and there will be answers and there will be the return of the raffle. Yes, <laughs> that's why you're all here, I know. Um, yes, woohoo. Um, I am not Lee Lewis, my name is Daniel Evans and I'm an associate artist here at Queensland Theatre and it is my pleasure to be with you all tonight. Lee is captaining the first production of the season and what a team she has assembled for a battle match that is funny, ferocious, and highly flammable. Family Values begins at a birthday party. That seems like a good idea at the time. Roger is turning 70, and all he wants is some quality family time with his wife, Sue, and their three children. But in the opening moments of this play, daughter Lisa slams open the front door with a detention centre escapee called Saba at her side. Her plan is to hide out in Roger's holiday house until they can think of what to do next. She just needs to find the keys. Into the fray arrives Michael, who has recently found religion and is now following God's plan for his life. Then, to round out the party, Emily, fresh from a marriage breakdown, blows in with her new love, Nolene, a border force boat commander. Mm, yes, the stage is set with an impressive guest list. It's part comedy, part drama, part cover your eyes with one hand and hope everything works out for the best. Family Values is a rapid-fire 90-minute season opener by one of Australia's most esteemed playwrights, brought to life by the exceptional people sitting next to me. So, if I could ask you all to introduce yourself, we'll go along the line, and to say what role you play in the production. Should we go this way? Hi, my name is Amy Ingram and I play Emily, the youngest of the three. Hi, my name's Helen Cassidy and I play Lisa. She is the eldest and the one who appears at the beginning with uh, Saba the refugee. Oh. Hi, my name's Jodie LeVacant and I play Nolene, who is a... Uh, uh, border Force Captain, <laughs> and <laughs> I <laughs> thank you. I am, <laughs> and I am the uh, partner of Emily, the youngest child, about to be married. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Seppi Bergiani, and I play Saba, the Iranian, who at this time in the play is a refugee. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Moore, and I play Sue, who is married to the wonderful Roger. <laughs> I'm 70, I've got nothing to be happy about. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Leon Kane and I'm playing Michael, the lucky fella who's found Jesus. <laughs> I'm Lee Lewis, it's so lovely to see so many of you at the beginning of the year and I get to play the director. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Renee Mulder, I am the set and costume designer. Hello, I'm Benjamin Brockman. I'm the lighting designer. And I'm Tony Brompton, the composer and sound designer. Okay. Thank you. Yes, what an incredible team. I'm not going to be asking all of the questions tonight, but I will kick us off. So start thinking of any question you might have about any facet of this production. Nothing is off limits. Um, well, not nothing, but you know. <laughs> A really good meaty question will be very much appreciated and I'll throw it open shortly. But first, Lee Lewis, let's start with you. 
Um, first of all, congratulations. Through flood and pandemic, you have made it to season 2023. Well done and welcome back. You, have, you actually have a history with not only this play, but um, David himself. And in fact, Mr. Williamson, you are one of, the, one of Mr. Williamson's like prize directors. He, he loves everything you do with his work. I'm wondering, I guess to kick us off, what is it about David's work and this work in particular that appeals to you? And why is this the story to open your season 2023? Okay. First of all, I think David has had many great directors work on his work, not the least of which Aubrey Mello here up in, in Queensland. So that he feels very much that this is the best home he's ever found for his work because he just it's flat out says publicly around the country that this is the best audience. So I feel like this is the audience of people that he writes for. No, I mean that. I know he writes around the country, uh, but I, what, what's exciting for me is to make it for his favourite audience. So uh, the reason, oh look, I fell in love with David's writing when I was little. My mum and dad used to take me, I grew up in the country and mum and dad used to take me to the theatre. I was one of those lucky kids. Uh, and I was very little when I saw Emerald City. And I loved it. It was ever, it, was, it spoke about Sydney in the way that from, from a little country town of Goulburn, Sydney seemed magical. And that was how he wrote of it, the, the, the green and the blue and the, just it, it, all of it. And the performances. And turns out I saw Andrea Moore in that <laughs> show. So I fell in love with, with I, I thought she was the sexiest person I had ever seen. And I haven't said this to her, but that when was I, a long I was like, time ago. <laughs> When I grow up, I want a haircut just like her. And I did for a period of time, actually. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I fell in love with the experience of being in the audience for David's writing. And that, for me, has never changed. I love the way audiences connect right into his stories. There's a trust relationship, I think, we have with David as a playwright, where he know, we know he's writing us, and he takes full advantage of that relationship. <laughs> uh, and it, and it's sort of, he's sort of... It's okay if we don't love every play. We love his body of work and his relationship to us as a writer. Uh, so I think one of the reasons, as a, as a semi-grown-up director, when I approached him, uh, the first season I got to program at Griffin, so the first time I was an artistic director, there's that thing of what, is, what are the first plays I'm going to choose? And I chose Emerald City. Uh, because there was a lot of conversation about new writing and Australian writing and, at Griffin and, and there was a, a lot of push against David at that time and I really wanted to say to everybody, every playwright uh, belongs in a season of an Australian theatre company and it doesn't matter, it, it, the play is the thing that matters, not what I think your politics are, whether I think you're cool or not, it's the play that the audience wants and needs to see. So I got to direct Emerald City, which was beautiful and at the same year I also got to direct Rupert. So I was doing one of his older works and his newest work at the time and that was an amazing experience, I was petrified. I thought, oh my god, if he hates, I can't remember which one came first, but I remember thinking on the one, don't mess this up because you've got another one to go. So we worked really hard together that year and established a really great conversation about Australian storytelling. Um, then so we sort of went from there. Uh, and then this one, he sent to me going, look, this is, uh, th I'm, I'm retiring. This is my last play. And the ensemble doesn't want it because they've said it's too edgy. So I read it and I was like, Oh, it's got just enough edge for me, I think. <laughs> um, and I really liked that he was leaving it all out on the field with this play. He was politically really angry when he wrote it. Uh, and he just, he also ha felt like, given that he decided he was going to retire, uh, he was in a good place with his writing. And I think, you know, he kind of went, it was time to step back. And he wanted to do that on his terms. So he said, I'm going to just say what I actually think about the government at the moment, both sides of government. And it reminded me of the rage that he had in his early plays, but rage with comedy. And I think that's a gift he's always had. Uh, so I love that he was doing that. Of course, he then went on to, because the ensemble went back to him and said, could we just have another one? I'm like, no, this was the last play. But it's it still got an energy like that in, in that where he felt like he had nothing to lose by saying everything that he thought. But he just did it with such hope. And even though he was really angry, and I think, I am trying to answer your question in a short way. Sorry, Dan. Um, totally fine. The this reason is great. I love his writing is because he actually has hope in humanity. 
he, there's a hope in this play that people can change their minds. And he believes that. And I think that is what we really need at the moment, is a vision of a positive future, despite all the difficulties. <laughs> so I love that, he that he's telling a state of the nation play inside a family comedy. I mean, that's the hardest thing to do on the planet. And that's what a lifetime of writing for an audience that he knows and respects has led him to, is that, that capacity. So I feel like this is one of the jewel in, our, in the crown of playwriting, if you like. Does that make sense? I don't know. That was a really long sentence, sorry. That was great, brilliant. That was really good, well done. Okay, thanks everyone for being here tonight. We'll go all we'll go home. No, we won't. Um, I'm going to go to Andrea and Peter now. You are the matriarch and the patriarch of this family, respectively. And you, as Lee has mentioned, you've both been in a Williamson before. Um, can you tell us, what does it feel like to inhabit one of David's plays? Because they all come with a kind of special alchemy. I, I've never seen audiences quite respond to a playwright like they respond to David. And um, I guess, is there anything you notice about being inside the world of his works that's different from perhaps other plays you've done before? Do you want to go first? No, you always I'll go first. <laughs> 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 um, uh, hello, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Um, yeah, it, it's... I said this the other day w with Lee. It, it honestly feels like I'm putting on a really lovely, familiar old coat. There's something about the rhythm of David's writing. Um, I feel like it feels very familiar to me. Um, there's there are there's a sort of structure of the play. The, the the play begins with us and ends with us, and that's a very familiar structure. If you think of Emerald City, you think of the Perfectionist. There are other plays that sort of you know, um, and and I did do Emerald City all those years ago, 1987, um, uh, and 86 actually I think. Anyway, um, uh, and there's a lovely. Robin Nevin was in that production um, and, of course, I, I mean, for me it was an incredible experience doing that show because I was learning, watching these incredible actors and um, there was a lovely moment at the end of the play where Robin and John Bell had this moment together and I really feel like that is in the ether in our last scene. I don't know whether Peter does but um, Peter and I worked together, the wonderful Peter Kowitz and I worked together in a, a failed marriage, the, was the last one. <laughs> but this, this is a marriage that sort of managed to survive even though they they don't necessarily agree on all things. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, in just answering the, the, the question um, about Williamson, I, I, um, I, I started uh, with the Queensland Theatre Company and, and um, in the 1970s and uh, when Alan Edwards was running the country, the company, and um, I remember the, the Removalist was coming up for production, which is one of his early plays, and um, up till then, all the plays we had been doing had been, we'd all had English accents or American accents, and we, we, we were coming to do this play, which was actually done at Le Boite, but by the QTC, um, and we went, oh, what, how are we going to do Australian accents? <laughs> And, you know, we, we have to go to the pub and we have to sit around. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I'm from country, you know, Queensland. I had no problem with an Australian accent. But we, we did. And, and so, and, and, and that, was, that play was such a success. Um, and I don't even think Alan thought it would be necessarily. But after that, um, Williamson um, was in most of the seasons with his plays, and I've done about four or five of them, and I'm sure Andrea's done about the same, yeah. Um, it's a part of what we do as actors, and it's, it's, it, we owe David so much, um, and I'm so pleased that I can come back here and do a Williamson um, at, at this point in my career, and at this point in, in his career, I'm not retiring. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> does that answer your question, Dan? It does, does. Thank you both so much. Um, this play, I mean, one of the things that we have inherited from Williamson, or one, one of the things that Williamson does so well, is this idea of what we call a closed space, closed time play. And what I mean by that is, this is a play that takes place on this set you can see behind you, and we'll talk to Renee very shortly. But it also happens in a closed time, which is to say there's no lights up or lights down between scenes because we really do watch this whole thing unspool 
in real time. So we are living with this family for approximately 86 minutes of, which is kind of scary if this is what 86 minutes looks like. But <laughs> um, a, lot a lot can happen. My question to the, um, maybe the rest of the ensemble is, how is that? That feels like, a bit, that, that's a bit like an Olympic sport for actors, is it not? To kind of go, when I enter onto the stage, I will not exit for another 80 minutes and I will be <laughs> under the microscope. There's nowhere else to, uh, Helen, do you wanna? Well, I love it. That's my <laughs> favorite because it t time just goes faster. It's over before you know it, particularly with this piece because it it picks up pace. <laughs> it it kind of it's like a it's like a snowball going downhill. Uh, so once it starts, it, it's just great to be in it for the ride. I find personally, it um you get to live within the piece more, which is uh, it's a lovely place to be as an actor. <laughs> Yeah, I've, yeah I've, I haven't done a kind of naturalistic play like this for ages. It's been a long time since I've been at uh, QT, many years. Um, uh, yes, I, it's a, it, real time is great for me. It's um, talking over the top of each other. It's just, yeah, it's, it's over in a second. Um, yes, well, what, what else can you say? Um, yeah, I mean, you'll find out when you... When you it's like, it is like being at a, a really bad family... Christmas or something where everybody has, <laughs> everybody's got different political, it's, yeah, my family, it's, if you come out to my, I'm the youngest of six and oh yes, we have our, we have our debates and um, yeah, it's quite familiar in that way. Hmm. Well, let's drill down into that. Let's go, let, let's get a bit psychological on this. Um, so, Amy, Leon and Helen, you all play siblings and we've kind of covered how you're quite different. I mean, Helen, your character is very politically active. Amy, your character has detonated her marriage and, Leon, as you said, you've found Jesus. Um, and <laughs> I'm wondering, what makes you similar? Like, it, it, what makes these... What, what's the common denominator? What's the family gene or DNA in these characters, for better Ma or worse? Mum ruined our lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they're, we, all, they're all brats. <laughs> they're all entitled. Yeah, well, we're, we're like, we're awful but children. For, for some reason, they have a lot of traumas. Well, so. We were saying there's a great, there's a sense of service that's been instilled from their mum and dad, being we've got a high court judge and a high, amazing social worker. And I think in very different ways, they are all serving very different ways. <laughs> and they all want to prove something and to make a mark on the world, I think, mm. or even just a mark on their own little world. It doesn't need to be huge, but they want their part in it mm. to mean something. But it, but like all, you know, good players, everything can't go well right. So it all kind of disintegrates as they try, basically. But in some way, but they're they, all serving the greater good. Yeah. Their greater goods are very yeah. different. <laughs> Brilliant. I actually just wanted to jump in there. David writes his plays, I think, by sitting around dinner tables and listening to what his friends are talking about. So <laughs> I think I, I'm fascinated to know what conversations <laughs> actually led him towards, towards this critique of everyone's kids. Because the three kids are, they're, they're fun to make. I think that's the interesting thing about uh, casting a Williamson is that you don't really have to sell it to actors very hard because the characters are so full and he offers so much scope that people go yes or no really quickly. They look at it and they go, oh, I want to do that, or, oh, I could never play that. It's no, there's not a lot of conversation about why, because you look at this potential that's inside the words. But these three kids, they're full on in three different ways, and I just kind of go, I feel like there should be generational apology at the end of this play. <laughs> um, well, our our oh, yeah. first week was the week leading up to Christmas, which it was, it was close to the bone, actually. <laughs> That was <laughs> brilliant. Everyone was like, okay, so um, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> See you next year. Don't make me go to my family. <laughs> um, I'm going to come to Jodie and Seppi now. because Jodie, um, well, firstly, I, remiss not to welcome you back to Queensland Theatre. The last time we saw you on our stages was in The Memory of Water, yes. I believe, which was like 10 years? Oh, don't. Don't yes. even. Don't even yes. don't mention it. Um, and your entrance in this work really sets things in motion. Um, and I hope you're all getting the sense that this is a very fast, moving, spirited kind of production. I'm wondering, um, maybe you can um, illuminate for us, 
in rehearsal, I mean, it all sounds fun, doesn't it? It's like uh, overlapping dialogue and shouting lines, but um, is there a real architecture to the conflict? Do you have to kind of go, oh, I've got to lay this here so I can erupt a bit later or mm. I can't go too big? Or how do you share, how do you create an argument that just isn't white noise? Like, What, what are some of the yeah. things you find yourself... Uh, I think Nolly, oh, as I said before, I think she's, spoke, she's, um, she's a captain of a high-speed border force uh, vessel. So, <laughs> so along with that job comes uh, a certain personality type. Like she, um, it's a very high-pressure job uh, where you have to, you know, keep calm and cool and have your focus. And uh, and uh, she has, she's also proudly queer, and uh, she knows how this family, some of the members, feel about about the choice that her daughter has made to to be with um, a same-sex partner. So she comes in, I wouldn't say she comes in swinging, but she comes in, she's quite a grounded person, I think. Mind you, I'd never date her. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. <laughs> I just, um, I've just, yeah, anyone in the military or that, I just, yeah, no deal. But uh, she <laughs> uh, she's quite grounded, so, but she's prepared to fight. She's prepared to stand up for her beliefs. And um, so any kind of, any kind of, provocation to be right I'm there <laughs> with my opinion and I'm going to make it make it heard and loud and clear uh, so yeah I wouldn't say so she's she's not on the back foot at all she's not she doesn't explain not prepared to um to put up with any bigotry or anything like that so yeah she does come in and she she sets things she sets things alight and um and like uh um Roger says, he's, you're really not... She's like, I'm not prepared to pull any punches. And he said, and you're not. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of who she is. Um, her, so she also has no... She doesn't have a lot of patience for people who, uh, I guess, have mental health issues, even though she probably has some herself um, in that job. Yeah. But she obviously compartmentalises those and puts them somewhere else, um, and which is why she's quite harsh on people who do. And uh, she sees, I suppose, in her job, it would be seen as a, as a liability or a, um, a weakness. So she's really hardline on that as well. Um, yeah, does that, is that enough? It does, it yeah. does. And I'm wondering, so when things, start, when things really get going, they really do get going. And, and, and Lee, you know, I, I, I read this and I was like, oh, it moves at such a pace. How do you, how do you directorially control that? Or, or what's kind of, what, what's been the, the large focus of rehearsals for you in terms of, putting, I don't know, petrol underneath this. Do you need to put petrol or are you more like filming the flames going, calm down, everyone, not yet? Uh, no one ever really wants to hear this about a work like this. You seem to... Everyone wants to think it's great fun in the room and we um, there's a relaxation. This kind of comedy is really hard. It's really precise. It's like Olympic ice skating mm -hmm. uh, in that there's a domino effect of any error that impacts everybody else. So if I say I'm going to pick up this glass and move it over to there, I need to do that consistently so because someone else is going to pick up that glass and move that. And we can really... The energy of the show can only get going once the physical architecture has been built. So I think it's been a miserable rehearsal process for everyone. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion that people are like going, oh, I thought this would be more fun. <laughs> but, but, but virtuosity, which is what David asks for, technically, uh, is really hard to build. But it, uh, the, the closest thing I can come to is, is um, uh, Torvalandine. We all loved that uh, bolero, but gee, that, that she hurt herself a lot making that. <laughs> and I think th that the, once they got to that level of precision and control, then we all got to enjoy it. And I think they had fun doing it once they could do it, but it's really difficult to make. Mm. And then there's such a density of choice that has to be made that if you change one thing, you kind of got to negotiate it with everybody else on stage. If I leave this chair out, does that, does that get in the way of anybody else? And on the back of that, there are these extraordinary humans that then have to interact. So it's a complicated thing to build and it involves a lot of repetition. Oh, <laughs> gosh. It is, you're all not only have to be amazing actors, but amazing technicians. And um, last question, then I'll, I'm going to come to the, some more of the design um, team. Um, Seppi... You are almost belong in a different play. I'm sure your character must think, what have I walked into? Yeah. Um, how has your preparation di perhaps differed from everyone else in, in, in taking on this role? I'll start um, off. Well, hello. Hi. Um, my, I feel like my life has been my preparation. And um, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm Iranian. I grew up in America mostly. And I did live in Iran for a year. And my parents used to drag me to Iran for summers to see family. And often as a kid, I'd be like, why are we, why are we here? Why are we visiting? And, um, you know, there's a, it's a very different world um, in Iran. And I think now I'm so grateful that I had that experience to be able to connect to my culture. And it almost feels like everything was leading up to a moment like this so I could speak about it. Um, and then especially with what's going on in Iran, uh, before this play came into my, my world, uh, as an Iranian, there was many days I wanted to just scream out somewhere, and I didn't have a place to do that. So the preparation, I think, has, it, it exists in me as an Iranian. Um, and then there's also the research that I did was, you know, I looked into the people who ended up in Nauru. Um, and I found out that there were so many Iranians. I had no idea. I didn't even realize the number. I, I, I always thought that that wasn't us somehow. Um, and then I started to find out from my mom and dad's family members that some of them had to travel here to Australia uh, in ways that they didn't want to have to do. Um, and, you know, they've asked me not to share their stories, but I, I know them, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, so I think the, the research has lived in me, in a way. Yeah. Um, and, then it's, uh, and then with what's happening, there's this really amazing, unique experience right now where we get to talk about something in real time about an issue that I imagine most people are aware uh, of what's happening in Iran. Um, and I find that extremely beautiful and um, touching and cathartic for me, so uh, yeah. Thank you, mm. beautiful answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sippy. Oh, yeah, well done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Renee. Renee Mulder here. There you are, down there. Hello. Um, now, the last... Look, this is very different to yeah. First Casualty, isn't it? <laughs> just a little different. Just a little. Just a little bit different. One of the things I love <laughs> about this space is how is how uh, is watching designers transform it and, and change its skin and its muscle and its bone. Where did this, can you speak a bit about, about where this came from and perhaps some of the touchstones maybe you're referencing in this design? And also, part two of the question, why are some parts of the set perhaps unfilled or left in a kind of imagined space? Yes. Um, well, obviously, with a script like David's, it's, you just have to support the words and you have to support the cast so that there is a, obviously a sense of realism within this. But what Lee and I kind of didn't want to sort of box in too much was the the outer regions, the outer areas of the space. So it's it has it's set in Brisbane, it's set in you know in Ashgrove. Um, so it's what you know we're trying to be. I'm trying to be sort of quite specific with the with the <laughs> <laughs> with the architecture and the architectural elements of you know a typical Ashgrovian house or a um, almost like a Queenslander kind of feel about it ish. Um, but the the outer kind of areas are sort of sort of the textures of the world. We're sort of we're sort of looking at these sorts of pe these sorts of elements of architecture in more like an exploded view of a house. So you know we've got a window frame there that's sort of floating in space, but then behind that is possibly the texture of what the roof might be. Then we've sort of got you know the timber flooring matched with maybe some tiled floor. That it's kind of this sense of seeping off into the into the greater kind of zone of the audience and the theatre blackness itself. So it's kind of that sort of general, sort of gentle graduation. Well, it's yeah. a, it, I think we talked about how do we reflect the way David's plays actually seep into us. They're, they're a play, but they're also so much about us. So there are moments in the play where it drifts into a, your own life. You kind of go, oh, yeah, the, like you said, close to the bone. Um, mm. And was there a way, we were trying to explore a way to express that in the theatre space as well, rather than build the full house? Yeah, yeah. yeah just to have a bit of fun. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a natural, it's an abstracted naturalism. I love that. It looks very, I feel like I've been in this house before. I probably have. Um, maybe it's my own. Um, I'm sort of uh, moving on to Ben and Tony maybe at, the, at the end there. Um, this is an electric play. It goes very quickly. And I'm wondering, how do you breathe life into Renee's design? Or, or, or how, do, how does your work, I guess, complement what's going on on stage? Well, what are the considerations that are coming from um, perhaps a sound or, or lighting perspective when you first engage this text and what, as you're watching it come off the floor and on, into life? 
Uh, I guess my, like, my job is very much just to get out of the way. And often, like, theatre lighting is very, like, cha, cha, lights, boom, flash. Uh, where this is very much, you, you just need to settle into the naturalism of it. It's also, like, it's a comedy, so it needs to be bright, it needs to be accessible, you need to be able to see people. And I guess my role here is just to emulate the sense of time. So to start off at, like, four o'clock in the afternoon and then end with the sunset and then possibly transition to the next day. So I just need to get out of the way of, of, of what's happening and let the whole space be alive and help you feel comfortable in that space. So it needs to be warm, it needs to be inviting because if I, if I turn it cold, if I, if I make you feel isolated from it, that you're not something that you're not used to living in, then I will have sort of torn away your connection to these people. So that's very much how I see my job in this production is just to make it feel as warm and as inviting as possible so that we can access them and then just give us a sense of time. But it's interesting, even like, you know, Lee's saying that this piece is like figure skating. I imagine that's a bit what it's like with lighting as well. Like you have to really carve out light from dusk to evening. That's a and almost imperceptibly, that's quite, that's quite a, a feat in and of itself, really. Yeah, designing this type of naturalism is possibly the most difficult task that a lighting designer can have because with hyper-theatricality, you have a little bit of, of, of licence. You can There's give and take where this needs to be perfect. Like, you need to feel that someone can walk across the stage and you don't see the, the peaks and valleys of, of what I've done. So this, this type of work needs, like, hundreds of fixtures just to make it feel... Like, it's imperceptibly bright. And all the fades are, like, 30 to 50 to one minute. Like, they're all really elongated, like, time lapses. Mm. You know, nothing in this is, is under 10 seconds. Wow, that's incredible. Um, Tony. The sound I just cheated and just recorded an atmosphere that went for, like, an hour and a half. <laughs> um, <laughs> which sounds easy, but trying to find... 90 minutes of continuous sound where you don't get the neighbours having a domestic or somebody starting up the lawnmower or something like that. Many, many recording things. Where um, did you find that, things. Tony? Uh, that they've come from my farm, but okay, yeah, copy. the actual uh, thing is from an old Australian house, 100-year-old Australian house, recording, doing those sorts of things and then doing multiple takes and multiple takes until you get just the right one for to be able to sit in that real time and hold that thing. Um, because the biggest thing when reading the play for the first time, you're just like, there's no space to be underscoring. There's none of those things. The way that David writes and the way that the cast have kind of put it together, there's so many, it's like the melody is there, the harmony is there, the counterpoint is there, all this stuff weaves over the top of each other multiple times when everyone's talking in and out and through and over the top of everyone else so that all of that has to kind of hold together so that when we have those moments where a bit of music pops up, now and again, they do something different and shift us to another place to then bring Great. us back. So, a fiery 70th birthday party mixed with Torval and Dean <laughs> to the sound of a 100-year-old Queenslander house um, set somewhere in Ashgrove. Um, there are so many pearls that this incredible team have kind of like um, spilled out for us. Is, does anyone have any questions? Are they related to? Do you want to hear a bit more about? Put your hand in the air and I will, um, I will come to find you. Anyone question? Who wants to be the first? Yes, over there. Hello. <laughs> there is no, yes. Is the first question, is there an interval? No, there is no interval. So make sure you grab double the drinks. Okay, pause on, pause on question two or pause on that one, yep. <laughs> Yes, I, will, I shall... Rep oh, I'm going to try to repeat the question as eloquently as I can, and please tell me if I'm doing it justice. Question for the young members of the ensemble. When you're performing these roles... Um, when, you perform <laughs> when you're performing these roles, do you ever... Do, do you get an appreciation perhaps things aren't as bad as they are? Is that... 
Yeah. That feels organic, doesn't it? We've really, we've collaborated. <laughs> do, you, do you have a newfound appreciation, perhaps? I, I just, I feel that uh, we've told a lot of stories and obviously done a lot of research uh, in, the, in the creation of this piece um, about the refugee plight around the world. And it's impossible not every day to feel incredible gratitude that that we are here, cosseted in this corner of the world with immense wealth and privilege. So, and I feel like that has been an underscore of the whole rehearsal period. I mean, the play yeah. is called Family Values, and I think that's essentially what it's about. It's about what are our values? And, you know, obviously, you know, Seppi's got such a close connection to what's happening in Iran. Some others, others have, I have a very close collection, connection to what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment with a very close family. Um, we've been sharing these incredibly heart-wrenching, traumatic stories on a daily basis with each other. We're very aware of what's going on in the rest of the world. I'm, well, I'm sure we're not as aware as we could be. There's so much that we're not aware of. Um, but ultimately the play is saying, well, what are our values? And... Um, yeah, and I won't say any more because that's why you're going to come see the play. <laughs> but I think I think um, it's it's quite beautiful what David says about that. And do you act or do you not act? I guess is the question. Yeah. Beautifully answered. On those Andrew. values. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, up the back. I do, I absolutely do. So the question is, David Williamson writes this work, these, this script, um, summons this world on the paper, in, in the text. What direction does um, David give to costume, to light, to sound, to design? How much of that is him and how much of that is um, your artistic vision, I guess? David's actually very collaborative in that he doesn't dictate a lot. There's a, a vision of a world that he writes, but uh, we, we must have been about a week away from rehearsal where he, I was on the phone to him, he said, by the way, how are you designing this? Could I see a, a picture of the set design? I went, oh, sorry, I haven't I shown you? And sometimes when you've worked together a few times, you forget things like that with playwrights. I was like, sorry, David, it's a house. And he went, oh, so you're not doing an abstract thing? And I'm like, no. I said, there, there are a little bit of abstract moments, but there's the table and there's a couch and there's t you know, all of the things that you would need for this to happen. He went, oh, good. So he has a preference, I think, for there to be real space because I think he understands that real objects will support the actors and the audience in certain understanding. But, but that being said, when I did Rupert with him, he, he had this thing where I, I seem to remember he had written, I can't remember the name for it, Monsters. These monsters were supposed to r come across the stage and they ended up being an AV red stamp and he was totally fine with that. So he he kind of get, gets into the conversation and will let you follow down design ideas. But I think for th something like this, he likes there to be a certain semblance of reality because he doesn't want to distract people from in figuring out what the concept of the director is. But he's also very generous. So if I'd said, oh, I've got this great concept, I feel like he would have gone with me on it. It's just that for this one, I feel the conversation he's trying to have with the country needs to not be cluttered by something I might want to do to it. So, uh, so I think we've got all of the stuff that it needs, probably a little bit more at various times. Would that be a, yeah. Because I've seen, I've seen productions of his, I saw a production of his Travelling North, which was done on a very bare stage. Um, and I don't think he thought it was particularly successful, but he also supported the artists in making that. So he, uh, that lovely thing about a, a playwright with a long career, they tend to be very interested, but not too interfering. Doesn't mean they're not judgmental at the end. So <laughs> I'm hoping that actually our past work means he's okay with what I'll do. But I also get a little bit nervous when he comes to see it to begin with because he's trying to say something and he's putting his writing career on the line and I don't want to 
wreck that for him. You know, he doesn't. No, no playwright has that many chances to speak to their audience, and I don't want to mess that up with other ideas. So he's an interesting one that way. Great, thank you. Yes. The question is: Has it has this play ever been staged anywhere else yet, or is this its first run? And Lewis. I can't ask you that. I can't answer that. I actually staged this before COVID in Sydney. This is one of the plays that got shut down by COVID, <laughs> and when I. Um, applied for the job, this is the one of the shows that I wanted to bring up. It was in existence, it would have been a, a cheap thing to bring in, but actually the way the world has turned out, I get to make it again here with, with a cast up here, which has been a complete delight. I've never done this before, I've never made a play again. Uh, and it's been really wonderful to watch his words in the hands of a, a, a new and brilliant cast who are making very different decisions about who they are. Just to, as, an, as a director to get to experience that and watch them shape it into essentially the same story, but very different sensibilities moving through all of the characters. And I think that's magic, that a playwright's words are not fixed, that the intelligence of an actor is, it, it animates it into a, a new telling. So it's, qu it's quite exciting. But yes, yeah, I think he was the most shut down playwright of COVID in Australia. Yeah. He had three shows on when COVID hit. We had, uh, here we had, we had Emerald City, down, uh, our production of Emerald City down in Melbourne. That got shut down, uh, Family Values got shut down, and um, the one at the Ensemble. So three plays actually were stopped. So I think he's quite excited that the, there's, it's back on stage. Something gets... Brilliant. Uh, and I think he's curious to see uh, whether the change in government will make a difference, because he wrote this under a different government. But he was, and I think he was genuine when he said he was angry at both sides of government for the underlying lack of values they had. So I think it's unfortunately still as necessary. Brilliant answer. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. That's a good question. Yes. Okay, so the question is, um, all these people are amazing professionals, but are they taking any steps to perhaps protect their own emotional well-being, given that this play is a bit of a, um, what, what, what would you call it? A it's like a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that sounds healthy. <laughs> um, well, it sounds really I'm, emotionally I, I'm healthy. I'm not taking any step, but I'm, I'm doing okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think this links back almost to the like, question earlier about what it's like doing a play that happens in real time because it's you sort of take a breath and you go, here we go, because there's no... You have your own internal character markers of things that you have to build and grow and get to, but you have to just kind of take a breath, close your eyes and jump in because... And then you'll blink and you'll be in a different spot and then you'll blink and then it'll be over. But it's... In some ways, it's actually a real gift because we often dream about doing roles where you get to just throw yourself in and almost forget your job. So, th the, in some ways, we, you just go on the wave, go on the ride, and then hopefully there's things that you can do like at home to kind of go, okay, thank you, Emily, off you go. You can go to that side of my brain and Amy Ingram can come back to this side of the brain. Um, but yeah, I think it's just important to you know, stay connected with your outside friends and family and, um, you know, all that sort of stuff, I think, yeah. Hey, Seppi, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah I think um, I've just had to accept that it's going to hurt a little. Yeah. And I think that was my mental space I had to go to, was just allow, allow that to be um, and not be scared that it's going to put me in an emotional space that feels real and... Uh, not try to overprotect it so that way I can bring a real performance that comes from, from a very meaningful place and then can therefore have um, meaning for, for all of you. Um, so and all good roles, I think, or all good plays or all good parts, you always should leave a little piece of yourself behind. You know, it should change you, it should affect you. And so I guess the trick is to embrace that change as opposed to fight it off. Yeah. 
But it's such a wonderful question because, you know, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about the you know, this whole new wave, really. It's very new of actors' well-being, you know, because um, we do need to look after ourselves. And um, the girls' dressing room is a lot of fun. We get on very, very well. Um, we're a really happy cast and that helps, you know, that you've got each other. Um, and, and it is a play that sits in a certain style, in a way, because Williamson's work is slightly stylistic too, so... I think Seppi's the one who has to do. She's got the hardest. She's got the hardest. <laughs> right. It Thank you. It is also interesting, Dan. Though, uh, somewhere in you, you've got to also believe that the play is worth it. That what it's saying is worth the sacrifice. You know, I think we've all got different ways of expressing that that thing of that little bit of yourself that you give up or the amount that you let it in. But you do that if you believe in what the playwright is saying or trying to do. And Sometimes you have to take a job just because you need to pay rent and you don't necessarily have that feeling and those are the ones that hurt the most in a weird way. But when you, when you believe in what the tr play is trying to do, it's a balance. Are you okay to do it at this point in your life? Uh, and when you feel the audience, it, 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 you're doing it for an audience and when you feel the ideas of a play actually meeting the people it's meant to speak to, you kind of go, that's why we do it. And if the play can do that, if you... And that's the beautiful thing about David. You can trust his writing. Um, and yes, he asks... He writes ridiculously long sentences in a quite Shakespearean <laughs> style that require enormous breath control. So there are moments where the virtuosity just brings you back to the practicality of pr the profession. But by the same token, he spent his life trying to do this. And this is... He's right... This is peak David, this play. And you kind of go, as hard as it is in various moments. And there have been some really sucky things in rehearsal as we looked at some of the behaviours. Uh, you kind of go, it's going to be worth it because it's going to speak to the audience. And that's the kind of lovely thing about working on, a, on such a great writer's work is that you know it's going to work. <laughs> you just have to do your job and manage the, manage the hurt, manage the intrusion, manage the question. Yeah. Right. Coming to you. Question. Yes, uh, it was a triple X, and we had intimacy, intimacy director. Yes. Okay. It's true. There, are, there are a group of people who are starting to specialise in working with pro in productions uh, to assist everybody in the production with the management of the more extreme behaviours, uh, not just not just when there's fighting or, or, or physical contact, but sometimes with more compl some of the more complex psychologies that we look at. Uh, look, those are conversations that I have with the producing team when we're putting together work. What does the play need? Do we need an intimacy director on the show? Who's directing it? Uh, who's working on it? Uh, sometimes when you're working with very new actors, that can be useful because they've been working with it in the training institutions and they understand what that device can be in a room and how that can serve them or that person can serve them. As a director, uh, it's also about my relationship with that person because they're directing in the space with me. So w w when do I think it's necessary? I've got a, a, diff a group of different people that I call on when, um, when I need that and it depends on the story and what their specialty is. Uh, this is a very, it's an interesting question, it's a very intimate play but it's a, a play done by a group of senior artists. So I felt more uh, confident not necessarily having that position in the room because I f I'm trusting their capacity to speak to me if there is a problem. Um, and I, I hope that was the right choice. <laughs> yeah. But we yeah. all navigate with each other, you know. That's, mm. that's part of the rehearsal process is you speak and ask and go, is it okay? Is it okay if I do this or do that? Or, by the way, I'm going to punch him in the arm there or, you know. But you, you, there is just a constant negotiation of touching and 
shouting and is it okay? Like I pushed Helen the other day and then I was like, I'm really sorry, was that okay? And then Helen was like, I just wanted to push you back. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what, I, that's what I mean. Actors established in their process who've worked together before, have worked in the company before, uh, that l led me to go, I don't think I need that on this show. If, we, if in the first week the conversations had got uh, to a point where I felt I was out of my depth, there are people that I would call on and they would come in. Um, but we seem to be doing okay so far. Great. Okay, we've got a couple more questions and then we have to finish up. But yes, up the back. Oh. Is the play translatable? Could you take it to Hong Kong or New York or, or dot, dot, dot? I don't know. David's work has travelled overseas, uh, both on stage and when it's been translated into film. Uh, I've always had a lot of luck with, uh, and I talk, when I'm talking about it, it took Rupert to Washington. And the Americans loved seeing the world through Australian eyes. Uh, I've honestly just got past a flood and a, a pandemic. I haven't thought about international touring yet, <laughs> but I'm going to put it on the list. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it would be great, actually. And I think, much like when we watch an American play, you know, you see all the problems of America in that play and you go, oh, thank God I'm not there. You know, that looks terrible over there. So you kind of go, oh, that's a real... Uh, I think they would love seeing an, uh, an Australian play to be able to go, oh, that's really interesting. Do you think we have those problems? There's a little bit of distancing that can help because, of course, every country has these problems at the moment and I think they would be interested. I just... I, I just couple of things to do. <laughs> I'm just hoping for a smooth season this year, to be really honest. <laughs> okay, yes, question there. So the question is about, um, to the younger members on the ensemble, and it's about um, if you were to transplant. Oh my gosh, I'm going to try and paraphrase your question. It was very, it was very, very well formulated. Um, if you were to transplant these characters in a different time, would they still read, or do you think these young people are specific to who they are to this time now? Does that feel like a appropriate? Yep. Um, <clears throat> I don't think so, because. Uh, they get away with quite a lot and, you know, if you think of, like, don't speak until you're spoken to us, <laughs> comparing us to that, they're worlds apart. You know, they, they, they are complaining about a lot of stuff and, you know, there's, there's, there's not even that much passive aggressiveness in this household. It's just, you did this, that's why I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very time and place, yeah. and they are of they are of their time and of their upbringing and of their political, his like the pl whatever's going on right now. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, even probably two thousand nineteen to now is different politically. So yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. I think there's a I think there's a particular selfishness that David is satirizing at the moment that I hope is of this time and place. <laughs> and our last question at the back, you've been very patient, I've seen you there. Yes, what's your question? So there's lots of going on in the play when there's lots of sound and stimulation going on on stage. How do you stay in your kind of like performer track or on your um, narrative arc? How do I you stay that's a in there? I think question for Pete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell it's a hard question. Um, I, I, I'm not really sure how to answer it. Um, other than the fact that by the time all of that gets added in, if you're talking about the atmosphere and the everything else that's happening, we, we start with a bare stage basically and a couple of chairs and we get 
um, we, we work the play into our, uh, into our bodies and um, our rhythms. And uh, by the time we get to uh, the third week, probably, of the, the, sh the show, uh, we know what we want to do. And, and we know we're going to have to do it in front of 400, 1,000 people or whatever. We can't be distracted by anything, um, by phones going off. Um, um, <laughs> all right, it's all right. Um, uh, or, or anything, or, or anything else that, that happens on on stage. So uh, essentially, we it's it's concentration. I mean, I don't know whether that answers the question, but but by the time that all of this, everything else is added on, uh, w we are we are in full concentration mode. Um, but it's amazing what what you know things happen in an audience. And our actors' eyes flash to each other because we can hear someone over there doing something with whatever, or someone um, uh, unwrapping their lolly. Um, but yeah, no, it's a good, that, that, that's a good question. Are you a student? Oh, great. Oh, good. Well, good luck with your career. Okay, and on that note, what a great segue. Good luck to everyone in this evening's raffle. Please get your tickets out. Now, the winner of this evening's raffle will be getting a double pass to the Gallery of Modern Art's summer blockbuster exhibition, Air. And if you haven't seen it, it's a real treat. And we're going to get perhaps, shall we get the, um, let's get the matriarch, let's get mum, let's get mum to, to draw the raffle. So hold on a second, everyone, can we all do a drum roll? Drum roll, please. Okay, here we go again. Drum roll. Blue E95. Oh, who's got it? Anyone? Oh, you can claim your prize soon. We'll come and give it to you now. Okay. Now, before we finish up tonight, um, have some rather exciting news. This play has actually gone gangbusters in our season, and so the play is extending and playing for another week. Woohoo! So, I know how exciting. So, if from what you've heard tonight, you think somebody might know who might enjoy the play, be sure to tell them to book quickly before it sells out. The same can also be said for our next show, Drizzle Boy. That's the winner of the 2022 Queensland Premier's Drama Award is almost now sold to half capacity. That one will not be extending. So, if you're up for something a little bit different in your theatrical journey this year, um, be sure to grab your tickets. And that will be directed by the fabulous Dan Evans. Oh, <laughs> who's that guy? <laughs> And so Come and see it. It's going to be really good. Yeah, for the next subscriber briefing, I'll be asking you the questions. I know. <laughs> oh, the tables will turn. Um, now, we still have season tickets available. Um, if the, We have eight, six, five, three play packages. You could choose this one, Drizzle Boy. I don't know, something else. Maybe Viet Gone or maybe something else. I'm not sure. Whatever you want to do. Um, and you can contact our very friendly ticketing team um, to find out more about that. Tonight has been brought to you by our production partners, BDO and Board Matters. Finally, thank you to the cast and crew of Family Values. I've been next door working on Drizzle Boy and I've routinely checked in on this room because I've heard shouting <laughs> and crying and much, much laughter. Um, and I am so excited to see all of these amazing technicians and craftspeople do their best Torval and Dean um, triple axle <laughs> jump pirouette bolero landing um, in a few days' time. Um, we are so excited for you to return to the theatre with this play, and we are also so excited to have you return to the theatre in general. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. To those who have come all the time, welcome back. And to those who are new to our subscriber briefings, come back again. Have a very safe drive home, and we'll see you in the theatre very shortly. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>